A promise of God that, that I rely on is from Lamentations 3, uh, where Jeremiah is talking about God's mercies and how they're new every day. Um, as a dad of a three-year-old and a one-year-old, uh, I rely on his mercies. Um, and I'm constantly finding myself asking for forgiveness from, uh, from my wife, from Sadie, from Tessa. Uh, and so knowing uh, that God has promised to, to give new mercies every day, hourly, minutely, uh, is something that, that I rely on. Good morning again. Uh, morning to all of you who are in warmer places. Uh, it's cold in here. Uh, this is Tim Ryman. He's our music director here. And some of you know Tim. You see him on the platform. And throughout this series, you'll just hear some of our uh, staff leaders reflecting on promises that are significant to them. But throughout the series, we're going we're gonna to reveal to you six promises that God makes that you can count on. And uh, I'm really excited to share this one with you today. Right on the doorstep of a new year. Now, New Year does funny things to people. I don't know what a New Year does to you. Uh, does it make you stay up late in hopes of another epic Mariah Carey meltdown on New Year's Rock and Eve or whatever it's called? Or, uh, or maybe it, it causes you to turn to a, to a new diet, you know, giving up all of the baked goods and sweets of the holiday season and voluntarily adopting a diet of coconut water, kale, and zoodles. Anyone know about zoodles? I was unfortunately introduced to those not too long ago, and uh, I wish I never had met them. Um, some of you, uh, a new year will drive you into the arms of an annual gym membership, and you'll experience the pain of the gym in January. The gym's not so bad, it's just terrible in January, as every, uh, every annual gym goer knows. Or for some of you, uh, will New Year drive you to make promises? Will tonight be a night where you make a bunch of promises that you don't intend to keep? Um, and I'm not talking about marriage vows, I'm talking about resolutions, uh, for those of you who are curious. Uh, resolutions, will, will, will that be a part of your New Year tradition? Now, promises are interesting uh, because so often in life, promises are not kept for us, whether they're resolutions or sometimes marriage vows. Or when you think about leaders or politicians who, who make promises to people so that they can get where they wanna be, they can get elected, and then they do whatever they want. They don't follow through on anything they said. And there's very often no accountability for that. I think for us, it, it may be hard to believe that there are promises that people actually keep, that there are promises that can be trusted, but that's exactly what we're talking about in this series. We're talking about six promises that God makes that are guaranteed, that are unbreakable, that you can count on, that you can build your life on. Uh, and as I may have mentioned, today's promise is, uh, I think, foundational for so many of the others, but it's also deeply personal for me. See, starting a few months ago, um, I, I discovered a new tool. It's called the Enneagram. Has anyone heard of the Enneagram? A uh, few of you have. Uh, the Enneagram. It's a, it's a kind of a personality typology inventory tool. And if you know me, I'm kind of obsessed with these things, Myers-Briggs, all the rest. Uh, but the Enneagram is different. It's not from 19th or 20th century psychology. It's built off of medieval theology, really. And it was a tool used in the Middle Ages for spiritual direction. It was a spiritual growth tool. And so that kind of got me curious about it. And so I took an inventory to figure out which of these nine types I most relate with and different growth things that might relate to that for me. And by the way, if, if you're right now really curious and you're already looking for inventories, let me just tell you, you can find a good one that I, it's a free one that I've taken that I really like. It's at a website, exploreyourtype.com, exploreyourtype.com. That's not a paid endorsement. Although if anyone knows how to get paid for those endorsements, I'll do them more often. Um, but I think it's just a really helpful uh, tool for you. So I took the tool and uh, you, you get typed as one of these nine different types and they got some names with them. But, but really it's understanding a little bit more about, about the things that you lean on, the crutches that you, that you adopt in life to, to get by. And, and a lot of the Enneagram is built on trying to leave those things behind to come into a fuller expression of who God's created you to be. And so it's a really interesting tool. And, and I'll spare you more detail on it. You can learn about it yourself. Uh, but what I discovered is that I, I'm classed as a type one that's sometimes called the reformer or um, the perfectionist is another thing that it's called. And, and one of the things that I learned, and this was so powerful for me, is that true to people who identify with this type, uh, pretty much across the board, one of the things that unites us is that we all have a very loud voice in our lives, in our minds, in our heads, and that is the voice of an inner critic. 
And when I read that, when I heard that, I was like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That ever since I was small, I, I, I just can, I, I just have always heard this voice in my head that is constantly judging uh, what I think and feel and do and say. And, uh, and suddenly when I read that, I was like, okay, this, this makes so much sense. This, this explains why Sunday afternoons at my house, we're not allowed to talk about church the morning of. We're like, you know, like what happened in the morning. It's like, we don't even bring it up. It's kind of, no, we don't talk about it. Because the moment someone brings it up, even if it's a good thing, my mind just immediately goes to this inner critic stuff, all this dialogue, and I'm just like, no way. We're, we're not talking about it. So we don't talk about church because it's just, I, I can't resist going to the critical side of things. It also explains home improvement projects for me. Uh, I'm a carpenter's son, so my dad taught me to do a, a lot, and I'm also really cheap. And so I don't pay people to do things that I can maybe do myself. And so I'm not necessarily great at home improvement stuff, but I do it anyway because, you know, I just told you why. Um, but, I, but I've noticed that there's this pattern I go through every time I do a home improvement project. And I think it's related to, to my type. I think it's related to this, this inner critic thing. See, I start off with determination. And for those of you who aren't good with words, I put emojis. This is the new language that we speak, right? Um, so I, I start with determination. So, so part of my type also is that I want to improve things. I want to make things better. I want to perfect my environment. I want to perfect myself and the people around me too. And, and so I start off you know, with determination. I see something that's broken, that's not right, something that can get better. And I'm like, we're going to fix it. We're going to make this better. This is going to be awesome. And I start off with a very determined, like, we are going to do this kind of attitude. And then I moved to phase two, and phase two is dread. Because <laughs> then I, I start doing a reality check of all the things that are going to be involved. And I also know that, that I'm not a carpenter. I'm not really up for all of this. And there are going to be things that, that make me feel really inadequate. And, and I don't really want to do it, but it's got to get done, and no one else is going to do it. And so that's when I move into phase three. Phase three, discipline. See, what I lack in skill, I make up in my work ethic. And so I roll up my sleeves and I get at it. And let me just tell you that once I start a project, I'm not one of these people who starts a project and then it's like, oh yeah, he started that three years ago. We're still waiting for him to finish. Not me. When I start a project, I am like a, a, a pregnant woman whose water has just broken. I'm like, this thing is gonna happen. And so day and night, I'm thinking about it. I'm dreaming about it. I'm working on it in every spare moment. I'm obsessed with finishing it. And I'm, I'm just so uh, disciplined and my work ethic is just... And then I get to a place where I'm about five-sixths of the way through with the project. Not three-quarters, five-sixths. Uh, maybe eleven-twelfths even, where, where I'm almost done and I can start to see it coming together. You know that place, if you ever do these projects? You can start to see it coming together and you think, oh my goodness, this, it's going to work. This is going to come together. We, we've almost tackled the problem. We've almost made it better. And, and, and there's this part of me that just rejoices and I feel proud and I feel accomplished and I'm so excited about when it's all finished. And, and then I, you know, that's about five, six of the way there. And, and then I finally get done and I stand back and I, and I look, sorry, I, that was, uh, I go to delight. Sorry, delight was phase four. That's delight. So that's that moment where I'm, where I'm so excited. That's phase four delight. And then I stand back and I look and that's when I go to phase five, despair. You may think, why despair? You should be excited that you're done. Because I start looking around and I see all the things that could have been better, that were wrong, that I should have thought about differently. And you see, that's when, you know, my wife, she, people come over, she's like, let me show you what Dion did. And I'm like, no, don't look at it. Like, seriously, like, you know, squint your eyes. And, yet it's... and what happens is that's when the voice of the inner critic starts speaking. The voice I know really, really well. You know, who do you think you are? Why, why do you think you can do this stuff? You're a pastor, not a carpenter. Come on. Uh, it's just not good enough. I, I know that people may be fooled, but you know it's, it's not how it should be. Do you ever think you can measure up? You, you missed a spot. These are the things that go on and on in my head. Now, I tell you this not because I'm looking for sympathy. I would seriously rather have my head sewn to the carpet with a knitting needle than to have you pity me. I'm not in for sympathy ever. I don't like sympathy. Uh, I could use maybe a good therapist, but I don't need sympathy from you. Um, uh, not sympathy. No, I'm just joking. Please don't send me your therapist's name. I don't want that in my... I don't want that in my email. Um, but here's, here's why I'm sharing this with you. Here's why I'm sharing this with you. Because somewhere along the way, you know, this, this voice of the inner critic that's been so strong in my mind and it pop, pops up all the time, Sunday afternoons when I'm doing a home improvement project. Somewhere along the way, I took this voice and I mistook it for the voice of God in my life. And, uh, and maybe you're someone who also struggles with this inner critic voice, or maybe it wasn't an inner critic, maybe there was a critic in your life, someone who spoke these kinds of things over you, 
and you heard this all the time from a parent or from a spouse or a friend or someone else in your life, and, and you heard these things over and over again in your life, and maybe you made the mis same mistake, that, that you heard those things, you took those things, and you mistook them, you projected them onto God, and you started to believe that these are the things that God says, these are the things that God thinks. See, I know that's what happened to me somewhere in my life, and I was a kid, and I grew up in Sunday school, and heard Jesus loves me, and I could sing the song with the best of them, and, and, yet, and yet, there was part of this that goes, yeah, I know God loves me, but this is how he really feels about me, he loves me because he has to, but, but this, you know, if you really dig into it, this is how he feels about me. And then I would go to church as I grew up and I would hear pastors talk and all of my worst suspicions were confirmed. You know what I'm saying? Does this ever happen to you? You leave church or a mass or whatever you call it, you leave a service and, and, and you walk out and you think, yeah, the old man upstairs, he's, he's ticked. And you walk out heavy Imagining that God is sitting up on his throne looking down at us, judging us, so critical, so frustrated, so disgusted with who we are. See, today I wanna to tell you, this is not who God is. He is not your critic. Uh, he is not your, even, even interested, we're gonna see this in a minute, he's not even interested in being your, your judge. He is not interested in tearing you down. He's, he's, not, he's not this fault-finding, suspicious, disapproving father. It's not who he is, guaranteed. Instead, today, we're gonna see a truer picture of who God is through a promise that he makes to us. And we're gonna see it through the eyes of Paul. Now, Paul, if you know about Paul, St. Paul, the Apostle Paul, he wrote a bunch of the New Testament. And I'm pretty convinced that if Paul took the Enneagram, he would have been a type one, just like me. He was a guy who wanted to make the world better and he wanted to do right and he wanted to be right and, and I'm pretty sure that in his mind there was, an, there was the voice of the inner critic that haunted him and I'm pretty sure he made the same mistake that we do sometimes. He projected that voice onto God and he believed that, that God in heaven was very critically, negatively minded toward him. But somewhere along the way he met Jesus and the doors were blown open on that deception, and he began to see God for who he really was. He began to hear a promise from God that changed his life. I hope this promise from God changes your life today too. So we're gonna look at Romans chapter eight, starting at verse 31, page 1133 in your Bible if you're here in the room or you can follow along um, on the Bible app or here on the screen. Paul says, what then shall we say in response to these things? Uh, what things, he just went through a whole long uh, list of what God has done for us in Jesus the mercy and the kindness of God. And, and he expounds it throughout chapter after chapter after chapter. And he goes, okay, so what shall we say then in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Powerful words, but also a powerful declaration in there. Paul is saying, God is for us. God is for us. He's not against you. He's not out to get you. He's not setting traps for you. And sometimes we think this, right? Sometimes we think, you know, you got, God, he's, he's tricky. You gotta watch it. Sometimes, you know, he'll set a trap for you or try to trip you up or he'll try, to, he'll try to mess you up in some way. Sometimes he's out to get you if you're good. Maybe he likes you. If you're bad, he doesn't. And Paul goes, no, 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 no. Understand this. God is for you. He's on your side. He's always got your interests in mind. And he says, if you don't believe that today, how else do you explain all that he's done? And I, and I just put that before you. How, how, else, how else do you explain the created world that we live in? If God is not for us, how do you explain it? How do you explain the, the gorgeous red rock buttes of southern Utah and northern Arizona and the slot canyons that are just so majestic? How do you explain the green majesty of the Smoky Mountains? How do you, how do you explain the, the beautiful sand beaches of the Gulf, you know, that white sand against the blue ocean? How do, you, how do you explain the created world if you don't believe God is for us? I mean, clearly, God, God gave us a world so beautiful. I'm just talking about the United States here. There are other things that are even beyond my mind that I've not seen, but but God gave us this world not to show off, not because he had to, not because, because geologically that's how it had to be. He did it because he loves us. He's crazy about us. And he wanted to give us a really beautiful world to live in, a world to explore, a world that would just make our jaws drop and our hearts swell. That's who he is. Why? Because he's for us. Because he loves us. How else do you explain it? Or how else do you explain Jesus? I mean, we just came off of Christmas. How do you explain the gift 
of God in human flesh given to us as a child. How do you explain the majesty of all of that if God is not for us? See, if you, more than that, more than that, if you don't believe that God is for you, then what are you even doing here? Really, I mean, what sense does it make for us to be here if God is not for us? Have you ever once in your life listened to someone, listened to the advice of someone, a coach, uh, a teacher, a boss? Have you ever once listened to the advice or counsel of someone who you didn't believe was on your side, who you thought hated your guts, who you thought was out to get you? Could you ever learn from a teacher like that? Or listen to a coach like that? Did you ever trust a boss like that? Of course not. Or, or have you ever been able to accept the help of a friend or a so-called friend who you didn't believe was completely on your side, but you thought maybe they were trying to set you up? Are you ever open to, to being helped from someone like that? Of course not. Or have you ever let down your walls and experienced true intimacy with a lover or a friend who you did not know was absolutely on your side, who was absolutely for you? See, if you, if you don't know this deep down, not just Jesus loves me, this I know, but if, if you don't know that God is for you, then what's the point of all of this? Because if you don't know that God is for you, you know what happens? Pretty soon this is what happens. I, I'm from the great state of Michigan, so I know how this whole thing works. Pretty soon this whole thing becomes management versus labor. You know this dynamic? Management versus labor, down here, I didn't know who this guy was. Someone told me that's the consumer, um, so he's cowering, but management versus labor. See, if, if, if we don't know that God is for us, this is what our faith easily turns into. So this guy over here, man, I don't trust him because he's got all the power and he's, he's bossy and he doesn't have my interests in mind and he tells me what to do and, and I don't really trust him because I think he's just trying to abuse me or use me or get over on me or control me. And, and meanwhile, he's thinking, well, I don't trust that guy because he's a good for nothing and I know what's in him and he's just a stealer and, a, and, and you know, I, who can trust this guy? And, and, and you play this dynamic back and forth. And did this work out well for American labor ultimately? Where are the factories today, <laughs> right? And I'm not saying that either side is wrong. The dynamic is broken. It's not healthy, it's not constructive. And you know what? The same thing is true in our faith. This is what's happened in our faith dynamic for so many of us. And you wonder why people are leaving churches? It's not because they don't believe in miracles or argue about the age of the earth or struggle with inconsistencies in the scripture. I, I, think, I think a bigger issue is if this is who God is, who ever wants to worship and serve this guy? And then there are a bunch of us, maybe who haven't left the church. There are a bunch of us who, who have stayed here out of, out of duty because we were raised differently because we would, we would never do that. It's the right thing for us to do. And so we stay, but we check out especially when anything difficult comes up, anything difficult is spoken about, we, we, we don't leave, we just disengage. So a guy in church stands up and starts talking about this concept of first fruits, giving God your first and best, not your leftovers. And, and uh, we're sitting there, we're not gonna storm out. I mean, maybe you would, but most of us aren't gonna storm out. Instead, what do we do? We just disengage. We say, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I see where this is going. I, I know exactly, I know exactly what's going on here. Give me your first and best. I, I know where this is. You're just, you're just trying to take what's mine. You're just, trying to, you're just trying to take me for a ride. You're trying to abuse me. You're trying to use me. We don't leave. Because we, we're, you know, we're too polite. We're too civilized. We know this is important. But, but we put up a wall. We disengage. And it only makes sense. Of course we do. Because why would you ever trust anything that this guy says to you? He's not on your side. He's not for you. See, Paul, he once thought of God that way. I, in my own life, sometimes struggle and I think of God in this way. But, but Paul, he had his, his, his you know, vision expanded and, and now he's saying, no, 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 please, please, please understand. That's not who God is. Instead, who is God? He goes on, and this is what he says. He says, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, 
How will he not also, along with him, along with Jesus, graciously give us all things? See, that guy up there, he's not going to give his son for you. He's not going to give you anything. You're going to have to demand and take and cheat and steal everything you want from him because he's not generous. But Paul says that's not who our God is. Who is our God? He's a God who gave us what was most important to him. He gave up his own son for us all. This is who we're dealing with, folks. Someone who is so generous, someone who is so in love with us, someone who is so for us that he gave us what we needed most. He gave us his son. And you know what? If he gave us his son, will he not give us everything else that we need? Is he going to withhold us from us anything that we really need in light of what he's already given? And then he goes on and he says, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. See, Paul begins to spell this out. He says, you know what? You can say, I know Jesus loves me. You can say, I know God is for me. But when you believe it, when you claim it, when you grab onto this promise, when you make it your own, things start to change for you in life. It's transforming. And the first thing he says, that when you really claim this, this promise is truth that God is for you, you will live above condemnation. I love that. He says, he says it's God who justifies, so who condemns? In other words, the, the one guy, the one being in all of the universe who has the authority and, and the evidence and the wisdom and the, and the justice to declare you condemned, he chooses not to do that. He takes that hat off and he says, I'm not interested in being your condemner. I want to justify you instead. I want to declare you to be righteous and worthy and loved. I'm not interested in condemning you. Not if you're in Jesus, he says. I've, sh I've shown you that in Jesus. And Paul says, you know what? That's profoundly life-changing if you realize that the one who has the authority to condemn you isn't interested in playing that game. Instead, he's interested in justifying you, declaring you righteous, declaring you right. And see, when you understand that God is for you and he's not interested in condemning you, but instead he's your justifier, then not only does that change the dynamic in your relationship, but that means that you'll no longer live under anyone else's condemnation, that spouse who's never pleased with anything, that parent who's never pleased with anything, that boss who's never satisfied, your own inner critic, you, you won't listen to that. You won't bow to that anymore. You will live above condemnation when you know that God is for you. Because if God has declared you justified, if he's declared you good and worthy and pleasing, even though you've got stuff in your life that is not, if, he, if he's spoken that over you, who are you to argue? Who is anyone else to argue with what God has declared? Anyone here big or bad enough to bring a charge against one that God has already declared innocent, righteous, good, loved, worthy? Are you, are you gonna disagree with God? And, and this is where this has been life-changing for me in that inner critic thing. You know, I've had to ask myself, Am, am I going to disagree with what God has spoken over me? Am, am I going to condemn the very one, speaking of myself, am I going to condemn the very one that God has spoken a different word over? Do you see? There's a difference between kind of saying, I, I know God loves me, he's for me, God loves everyone, he loves the world, God so loved the world, he gave his son, yeah, yeah, I know the promise. It's different knowing that and it's different claiming that. Because when you claim it, when you really believe that God is for you, You'll start to live above condemnation. That doesn't mean that you no longer admit fault because we make mistakes and you should own those mistakes. That's maturity and you should confess those things and you should make an amends with people. But, but that's different than living under a state of condemnation, living in shame, living in, in darkness. When you believe God is for you, you will know that he has spoken a stronger word over you and you won't live in a place of condemnation anymore. And Paul goes on and he says, uh, continuing to unwrap this thing for us. He said, Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God. And he's also interceding for us. I love that. That Jesus isn't just sitting in heaven, like enjoying it, enjoying the cabana service or whatever they have up there. Um, but, but he's there and he's, and he's interceding for us. He's looking out over us and he's seeing our troubles and our needs and he's talking to the Father about What's going on with us? Asking the Father to intervene. It's powerful, isn't it? What a powerful picture of a God who's for us. And, and then he continues and he says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? You know, this picture of Jesus interceding for us. Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? I love what Paul does here because the moment you start to believe that God is for you, what happens? Trouble happens. 
The moment you start to believe, no, God is on my side and he loves me no matter what, then, then you know what happens? Persecution or famine or someone gets sick in your life or danger comes into your life. And when those circumstances happen, what so often happens with us, we start to question. We start to wonder, is God really as good as, as I think he is, as he says? Or we start to wonder, have I, have I messed up so badly? Have I crossed some line in the sand? Have I, have I broken, it was that the last straw, the final straw that broke the camel's back? Was this the thing where God is finally like, you know what, I'm done with you. So you can start to believe that God is for you and then bad circumstances come along and so often we start to wonder, we start to question, we start to fear, we start to hide. Especially when the trouble or hardship or danger is self-induced, right? When you've made a mess of your life and you know that you are primarily responsible for that, you went against good judgment, you, you violated some commandment, and now you're, you're sitting in the consequences of that and you're, you're in pain and you're suffering, those are, the moments, those are the moments where it is so hard for us to believe that God is for us. And so what do we do? We, we run away. We hide in shame. We say, man, I, I can't face God because he told me and I, I did this other thing and now I'm in trouble and, and how, how could he ever be willing to help me? Here's what I need to tell you. When you really believe that God is for you, not only will you live above condemnation, but hardship will drive you toward him, not away. Man, isn't this true in life? When, when you're suffering, don't you look for, don't you run toward the people whom you know, without a doubt, are on your side, that are in your corner. I hope you have someone like that in your life, because if you do, you know that no matter what you've done, there, there are people on this planet that God has given to you, and, and you know they are so unapologetically on your side, so that when you get into a place of hardship or trouble, you, even if it's self-induced, you run toward them, and you find refuge and protection and help and comfort in them. You run toward the people whom you know love you no matter what, when you go through a season of hardship. And so this is a great litmus test for you today. When hardship comes, when trouble comes, when persecution or suffering comes, especially when it feels like maybe you're partially responsible for bringing that on yourself, what do you do? Do you find yourself running toward God? Or do you find yourself running away? Saying, I can't face you, man. I know what you're gonna do. I know what you're gonna say. You're gonna say, I told you so. You're gonna rub my nose in it. What? What is your reaction? What is your response? Because depending on your response, that's a clue about what you actually believe in your heart. Do you believe that God is for you? If he's for you and you know that if you believe that, then hardship will only drive you toward him. Even if it's, a, God, you told me and I made a mess of it, you will go toward him because you know he's on your side. He's for you. He will help you pick up the pieces. He will help you heal if he's for you. Then Paul, he, uh, he starts to bring it home here. It's, conclude this. He says, no, see, in all of those things, all of those circumstances, we are more than conquerors still through him who loved us. And then he says this, for I'm convinced, I, I, I believe this, I've claimed this promise in my life, and I hope today you can become convinced and you can claim this too. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that has been demonstrated, that has been revealed to us in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Man, what a promise. Paul at the end of it says, you know what? I'm now convinced. I, I went from this guy who you know, heard the voice of the inner critic and God saying, you're not good enough and it's never enough and you gotta prove yourself. I went from that to now being a guy who is convinced that there's nothing in all of the world, nothing seen or unseen, visible, invisible, on heaven, on earth, anything. There's nothing that can remove me from the loving protection, the favor, the declaration of a God who says, I am for you, I am on your side. Nothing can separate me from his love. He is gonna love me, Paul says, no matter what. And see, when you believe that's true, when you claim that, that your failures, your mistakes, your weakness, your circumstances, those things cannot separate you from a, from a God who has decided and I don't know why, it's just who he is, but he has decided in his heart that he will love you, that he will, he, will, he will be on your side, in your corner, through thick and thin. 
When you believe that, you know what happens? Not only will you live above condemnation, not only will hardship drive you toward him, not away, but you will trust what he says. Even the things that are hard to believe. Like, give me your first fruits. Give me out of, out of your first and best, not, not out of the leftovers. And, and count on me to provide the rest for you. And, and that's so hard to do because I got bills to pay and there's all these other obligations in life and I'd rather just give you, I'd rather look and see if I have anything left over and give that to you. And, and, and you can choose to do it that way, but, but if, if you believe that God is for you, then you hear that differently. You hear that as someone saying, no, 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 trust me, trust me. This will be really good for you. It'll change the way you live. It'll also open you up so I can provide things that you won't even believe. Or when he says, hey, it's your glory. It's to your glory to overlook an offense. Or when your brother or sister sin against you, even up to 70 times, seven times, forgive them. And we say, no, I cannot forgive them because they've hurt me and they've done it again and again and, and, and I can't let them off the hook because otherwise they'll think it's okay and it's not okay, it's not okay. And, and he's agreeing with you going, hey, it's not okay. I want you to forgive them anyway. And if you know he's on your side and he's not just trying to make you do hard things just for the sake of doing hard things, but he actually knows that forgiveness is the key to your freedom, that you cannot live a whole life holding on to anger or resentment a vendetta against someone else. It just is impossible for you. If you can just trust him, then you can do it, even though it's, even though it's really, really hard. When he says, seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, rather than chasing after all the other things in life, and I will, I will, everything else will be taken care of. I'll provide everything else you need. And we sit there and we go, I don't even know what you mean. What is the kingdom of heaven? I don't, what does that mean? And you want me to put that first? Do you want me to seek that first? I've got all kinds of other things I'm trying to seek and they're, they're important and, and I don't know that I wanna do that and I know it's a hard thing, it's a confusing thing. And yet if, if, if you trust that he's for you, if you believe that he's for you, then you listen with different ears and you go, I don't know what that means to seek first the kingdom, but I better figure out, I better figure it out because it sounds like a good way to live and I know that you would never ever lead me astray. So even the hard things, even the parts of scripture that, that pierce us in the heart, that, that sound so critical or, or difficult for us to hear, the things that maybe even offend us, when you know that he's for you, you hear those differently, not as, not as condemnation, not as words meant to shame us or insult us, but as words that are meant for us to listen to and trust. It says in Proverbs, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Even when you're feeling wounded, you know, it comes from a place of love a desire for your wholeness. Right now, here's what I want you to do as we close. I want you to close your eyes. And we're not praying exactly. I just want you to block out everything else. And today I wanna to ask you, can you believe that God loves you no matter what? Can you believe that he's for you not against you. Can you believe that in light of your flaws, your sins, the mistakes that you've made, the things that you've done? Can you believe that he sees those things, he knows those things, he may be even grieved by those things, but can you believe that that doesn't change, it does not change his disposition toward you, that he loves you still and he remains firmly on your side, in your camp. Can you claim that promise in light of your disappointments? You know, what are the trials that you're facing right now? What are the challenges? What are the circumstances that make you question God's goodness? Or at least question his goodness toward you that make you question your standing In those circumstances, can you claim the promise? Can you trust that God loves you no matter what, that he's for you, not against you? He's not, he's not beating up on you. He may be forming you, but it's all for your good. It's all for your growth. He's doing something glorious in you. Can you believe that? Can you claim this promise in spite of what your inner voice says, the voice of the inner critic? Or can you claim this promise 
in spite of what the voices around you say, those other critics in your life, those voices of judgment and condemnation who say that you can never measure up, you're never good enough, who make you always feel unworthy and unloved and inadequate. Can you, can you, believe, can you believe this promise from God that he has decided in his heart that he will love you and so he's gonna love you and he has placed himself in your corner and he's not gonna leave. Can you look at Jesus, the gift of Jesus, from the newborn baby to the man in the gospels, to the savior on a cross, to the resurrected king? Can you look at him and can you see him now as proof proof that God is for you. And finally, do you think you can begin to learn to live above condemnation in your life? Knowing that the one who has a right to condemn you is, has passed on that. He's taken up a different role, the role of justifier in your life. Can you begin to run to him in hardship as your refuge, as your hiding place, as your healer? Can you begin to trust what he says, even the hard things? So we're gonna close with one final chance for you to take this promise in, to declare this to your own heart, to claim it and to believe it, not so much to God, but to yourself, this promise that he is for you and he will always love you no matter what.